Everybody's got a story. You just have to listen. Hola, I'm Joe Partavilla, and this is Good Listen. Today, Kirsten Fleming tells her story. Now, Kirsten is my kind of human. She's funny, she's smart, and she has a lot to say. Kirsten's known for covering the intersection of sports and pop culture at the New York Post, and she's recently made the jump to a columnist at the Post, writing about everything from J-Lo, cancel culture, Joe Biden, and even the Netflix hit series, Baby Reindeer. Now, I've known Kirsten for years, but I never really asked her how she got started in the newspaper business and why she loves doing what she's doing. So I figured a podcast would be a good place to start. Kirsten, how are you? Good, how are you, Joe? I'm awesome. It's so great to reconnect with you. It's been a long time. And I want to start by talking about newspapers. So uh, you and I have sort of crossed paths many times in New York media, me as a radio guy and you as a newspaper person. But the newspaper has always been sort of the backbone of New York City. Like everyone looks at the, at the, the paper to see what the news is. Like TV stations do it. Uh, the Internet still does it. Um, can you tell me about your love of newspapers? Because my brother, like you know my brother as well, Arturo, loved newspapers when it you know, started his career in that. But how did you fall in love with newspapers? Um, you know, I think it was my my grandfather, my mom's dad. He had a routine that he, even when he would stay with us in New Jersey, he, he was from Spain, lived in lower Manhattan. And then when he would come stay with us, we lived in the suburbs. You could walk to the store, but like no one was really walking to the store. And he made sure that he walked every single day and it was probably like a half a mile, nothing great, but, um, and he always made sure that he got it. And so to me, that sort of impressed upon, this was like an important thing. And we always had newspapers in the house. My father, even though we, my parents are from the city, my, uh, I grew up near the Jersey shore and we always had New York papers. We had the Asbury Park press as well. And I mean, that was our window to the world. I loved, uh, channel four news, Chuck Scarborough, Sue Simmons, you know, we always stopped when that happened, but in the morning, it was like you had the newspaper. In the afternoon, you had the new, the Daily News, which I know I work at the Post now, but we were a news uh, family at the time. And my father always had it after work. He'd come home and bring it, and you know. And I just have that memory of my father on a Sunday with the paper spread out and over bagels. And it was just it was part of a routine, and it was an important routine. And what else was you know this is this was a one stop shop in a sense. It gave you your yeah. whole window to everything and. Then when I studied abroad, I studied abroad in Spain in 99 and I would, we didn't really have the internet back then. You could get maybe an internet cafe and, and pay tons of money and get dial up and then you get two seconds to look at something and then you're off. So I would buy the USA Today from the newsstand and it was always day late and I would just read it over and over and over again, nonstop. And uh, yeah, it's just... I don't know. It's it, it's such an integral part of my life, and and obviously I ended up working there. But uh, yeah, pretty pretty strong beginnings foundationally. That's awesome. And I know that there's this group think now that it's like fill in the blank is dying. You know, radio is dying, TV is dying, yeah. and then for many years they've been writing the obituary of, of newspapers. Newspaper is dying. And my argument to that is, it's really not. It's just changing the way how we read the newspaper. Like you mentioned, you went to that internet cafe. You were getting your, your USA right. Today International, but it changes. Right. It just evolves. Um, yeah. So when you hear that, as someone who's who's like basically made it their entire life's mission to work in newspapers, uh, what do you what do you feel when you see that? Because to me, I think it's bullshit. Like, yeah, like sure, it's like caveman tablets went away because they create the printing press. So like things change. But tell me about this idea that newspapers are dying. Well, I mean, I think as an institution, they're not dying, maybe as the newsprint and, and it gets smaller and smaller and, and some people say flimsier and flimsier. Our print edition, I still read it every day. I still, I, I'm in it. Most of my stuff gets in the print edition and, and I'm a columnist now. So I like to see it. I like to grab it, you know, go through it. And yeah, it's sort of yesterday's news at that point. But um, the print edition, I, I do love. I love to see my face in the in the print edition. There's nothing like it. So it's a little bit of an ego thing. Um but, but yeah, everything's changing in terms of the way we tell stories. That is evolving. The mass head is still here, and we're doing those same stories in a different way um, under that same mass head that Alexander Hamilton started so and established. And, uh, yeah, there's such a rich history there. And I don't know that, you know, I think there's there's arguments to be made about local news and, and you know, how we're covering it. and But newspapers... I don't know. I just think there's such a cultural foothold. Um, they're not going anywhere. We're just 
adapting. Um, there's things that are coming up, like, I don't know, there's like the free press, there's other things that are being established, uh, which are really, really cool because they're, we're growing new things, we're growing new institutions, but I think the old institutions, I think they'll still remain and they'll still be important. And, uh, you know, the Post is such an important newspaper to New York. So, uh, and I still have a lot of pride in that. So yeah, it, it's just adapting, it's changing, it's, it's it's utilizing video, it's utilizing technology in a different way, which I'm still struggling with because I like to write and not be on camera, but yeah, no, it's all evolving. That's great. Um, you know, it's funny. I hate the money, money morning quarterback things, but I feel like newspapers missed a boat by not getting behind paywalls early in the game. And and right now we're so inclined that like if I come across a story that's uh, behind a paywall, I'm like, nah, I'm not gonna pay for that. I'm, I'll just find the free version of that. And and it, it feels like newspapers missed the boat on that because now there's a lot of old white guys like me of like, I'm not gonna pay for my news. I'm gonna get it for free. So. Uh, what do you do? You, do you, you ever like reflect back? I'm like, man, I wish newspapers were a little more proactive when it came to setting up online digital description, uh, you know, subscriptions. And now we're in this world where they're trying to do it. And the New York Post is putting, you know, stories behind paywalls. I noticed that you have the New York Post uh, Plus, but uh, I sometimes feel like the newspaper industry like missed the boat on that. Yeah, I mean, I'm not the best person to ask about that. Like, I I look at it in that because we've always been. Free. We've we've never put our stuff behind a paywall because you look at and, and as you said late to the game right the daily news put is behind a paywall I'm, I'm not going to pay for a story and I think it you know it sort of has killed a lot of their business in the post almost it feels like a utility at this point because we're you know we've been free for so long the thing is if we all were behind a paywall it's almost like the the, the hole in the boat that you plug that you know another hole springs up. So it's right. like, okay, so you have Barstool Sports who, you know, aggregates and there's always going to be an aggregator that comes along and, and, and maybe changes it and doesn't do, they're not going to do it the, the way that you, you know, as great as you do it. And it's always, and I always try really hard to read the original story. Um, it, it's so worth it. It's so worth it. And I ha obviously have a lot of um, tools at my disposal and I can do that. And I can just say, okay, I'm going to give it to my, you know, we have different uh, ways to get around the paywall that we, you know, we obviously pay for it, but um, but yeah, I just think another hole would have sprung up. I don't know. I don't know. Like this is such a, it's such a wild west. You think you have everything settled, even with like Google and, and Facebook and NCO and, and all that stuff. And that was like the way, and now it's like, oh, they're not doing it like they used to. So they can change on a whim and then everything, your, your strategy changes on a whim. So I think the strongest argument is just to do really good work and find really good stories. And those are timeless. And the way that it's delivered and the way that people consume it will be different and will change, but there's no substitute for finding a story that no one else could find. That's awesome. Uh, there, and there's, uh, I know you're more of a newspaper historian than, than I am, but I feel like, I feel like the New York post invented clickbait. And I don't mean that in a negative way, like just the idea of like forming a headline that's eye catching that will, that will force people to read it. And now we're in this world where everything is clickbait where at the time when the New York post was doing it, it was before there was clicks invented, yeah. but just the idea of this like splashy headlines. Uh, what do you think about this clickbait culture we live in now? I think there's like a difference between clickbait. I think clickbait has become a little overused, but because it's like, it's promising one thing and it's offering crap, right? You know, it's sort of like, and, and I think, you know, in, in initially, I think we were really, really good at, at kind of keeping the spirit of our print headlines on online, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, there's a, there's a lot of, of papers that, that do that and headlines. I think people don't read behind the, beyond the headlines anymore. So I try and be, I know this sounds really, really like puritanical, but I try and be open-ended because people only read tweets. They only read headlines. They, if they do click on it, you know, like I'll get a, I'll get an email from somebody and be like, you are idiot you're this you're that and like they like they like say why they're annoyed with my piece but they never read it i can tell why what they're annoyed by is mentioned in the piece so they never read it so people like don't read and then twitter i'm sure you see it too people like yeah. love on twitter so i think almost like the clickbait headlines can rip like the tweet as well and you know it's it never really sums it up it never really tells the story and uh i'm just always cautious about it i always tell people like 
did you read it? Did you, did you, did you actually read it? And there are, yes, there are elements of it that are promising another thing and delivering absolutely nothing for your reflex. But yeah. And, you know, we talked about the evolution of newspapers. I want to talk about the evolution of Kirsten Fleming because I remember you back in the day when you were a scrappy reporter behind the scenes <laughs> and, and, and no one really knew who you were unless you worked in New York media. But now you're front and center. You're writing like front page columns for the New York Post. Oh, tell me about this jump that you've taken that where you've been a traditional writer to mm. now adding your opinions to your stories. What has that been like for you? Yeah, it's been really cool. Um it was never anything that I set out to do, to be honest. I, I, I'm i that person, whenever people like ask me about my career, I'm like, eh, I sort of went with the flow. Like I liked what I liked and I gravitated towards what I gra gravitated towards and it sort of worked out. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've been there for 20 years now. So I celebrated my 20th in January. I started out as the assistant to the editor in chief. I started out, uh, you know, three and a half years in the corner office, kind of understanding the business a little bit more and the business of news. So I think I benefited from that. I wasn't just like a reporter on the street right away. So I, then I became a reporter on the street and I worked in, you know, fashion lifestyle, uh, hard news, police headquarters. And yeah, the column's cool. Like it definitely, I, I had always been writing some opinion stuff now and again, and uh, the slot opened up and an editor of mine pushed me forward and was like, you know, you have a columnist sitting in your in your newsroom. And we had a new editor and he said, who? who? And she said, you know, Kirsten's a great columnist. She's an adult. She has great opinions. She, you know, very, she's, a, 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 you know, very formed opinions uh, and she has a sense of humor. So, uh, so yeah, so they gave me a tryout and you know, said so you have to lean into this and I loved it. It's super fun. It's also a lot more pressure because you can't just say, oh, well, I didn't mean that. You know, it's like you really have to kind of a gut check. And there's also things where you get like so frustrated over and you say, oh, this would be a great column. And then you sit down and you think about it and you go, that's a great tweet. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. It's just a great tweet. Nothing else. So, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so it's been fun. You know, what reminds me of it. I, I don't know if you ever heard stand-up comics do this. Stand-up comics have this could be this is this could be a joke and this could be something I talk about when I go on a talk show. Uh, so you have that level of of sort of awareness. They're like, Man, you know, this thought I have is kind of clever and funny, but I think that's more something that I'll tweet about. Whereas like the juicy stuff will, will will end up as your column. Yeah, absolutely. And it's and again, it's a gut check because you think, oh, I'm so passionate about this. And you sit down and you go, I'm not that passionate about it. I have one thing, I have <laughs> one thing to say, like it doesn't really have a backup here. And that's where the rubber kind of hits the road. And I think it's help me evolve as well but yeah you're 100 percent correct like i don't know that 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 was such an awesome thought and then you go no it wasn't it was an awesome tweet and that's it <laughs> that's it, great it's an awesome column so yeah uh you know it's funny because i've always admired you for your fearlessness because even before you were uh, a columnist you were just you had no fear like literally you're like the daredevil of, of of reporters that i've known you know you know i wouldn't say we're like friends but we're like we're like we're friends yeah. you know we, we know each other we stay in touch but 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 I, I like i don't know like how you really think and that's why i want to get you on the podcast is because i like i'm not i'm i'm the exact opposite of kirsten fleming like i i want everybody to like me and i know if you want everybody to like you no one really likes you um so tell me where this fearlessness comes from like this 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 boldness this brashness that i feel like a lot of people feel like they do but then once once their feet are against the fire like oh shit no no I'm not I'm not, I'm not fearless I don't know it's funny I like don't even think I'm, I'm that fearless because I think um but I guess I just look at it as I've always had a point of view and I'm the same way in a sense I do want people to like me I, you know everybody does and and you you know I'm not the type I'm not confrontational I'm not like an argumentative person but I also feel like if you disagree with me that's great isn't that wonderful and um, yeah, I don't know. I've been, I'm a bit of a, a big mouth. I've always just been sort of uh, opinionated. And uh, so it depends what, you know, you also have to know who you're picking fights with. Sometimes I pick fights with people who have been, you know, pretty uh, fierce back. But I mean, I, it is what it is. When you throw shit at a fan, right, it, some of it comes back to you. And I don't know that I, 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 that I am that fearless. I think I just have thoughts, I guess. And uh yeah, I don't know. Like, it's definitely sometimes you like file something and you shut up your phone. And then sometimes, you know, you write something that you think is going to be completely 
you know, not a like whatever, no big deal. And fart in the breeze and everything just like shoots back and like runs like, <laughs> you know, yelling at you and you're like, oh, I didn't even think it was that bad. But, uh, but yeah, I don't know. At the end of the day, it's, it's an opinion and uh, everybody has one as we all know that saying. So you have some level of fearlessness because you recently wrote a column against Howard Stern, who I know was one of the people that you, you know, for lack of a better word, idolized growing up because he had that for, sort of fearless streak and was just an, you know, and is an icon in the industry. And you kind of criticized him for his softball interview with, with Joe Biden. And I don't want to get into the actual column, but yeah. like when you write a piece like that, is that one of those where like, oh yeah, I'm going to get a lot of shit for this one. Yeah, you know, it, it, yeah, it is. Well, it, I also said, okay, what what does Howard Stern care? Um, you know, he's got a lot of money. He doesn't really care. But, but you know, I had a lot of people say to me, you know, he actually cares about the post and yada, yada. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I, 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 you know, you get a lot of blowback, but, you know, from his fans mostly. And, you know, people send you some really earthy emails and everything like that. Yeah, that, I mean, definitely. And those aren't, like, easy because you think about it, you're like, okay, I, I love that guy. Like, I absolutely love that guy. And I'm, it's not even a joke. Like, my mother started listening to him when I was a toddler on AM. And I came home one day and I sang some naughty song at the dinner table. And my dad was like, what the hell is she singing? And my mom was like, I don't know. So it's like, it's, it, I, I really, I, my, my childhood was really shaped by a lot by Howard Stern and, and my adolescence because I hold her brothers. And, uh, yeah, no, it's just, it's just when you feel it, you're like, that was a disappointment. And, you know, I write about culture. I write about politics. I write about sports and, and when it sort of crosses over into, into culture. And so if you feel it, I don't know, you say it and you deal with consequences. Yeah, that's great. And it's funny because, you know, so much has been talked about tribalism and I, I feel like tribes are good, but tribalism is bad. Uh, like you, we all need our group and support system, but this idea, especially, and, and I'm sure you see this in New York firsthand, because obviously the, the New York Post leans a little more conservative in a right. kind of a pretty liberal city. Um, and I, I hate the fact, and you talk about, you, you know, how you, you can debate with people. And I love that. I love a great debate. Like yeah. I, all the time, like I, I live in Charleston, South Carolina now, so I'm the, the car carrying <laughs> liberal in, 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 in a blue state. And I and I get to and I and I love to debate with people, talk to people about politics. I just love it because to me, from the way I look at it, it comes from a good place. Like, here's yeah. my thoughts. I want to know what you're thinking. Um, how do you deal with that in New York City? Because I'm just and in terms of and I know, like we said, we've already talked about, like you, you have your thoughts and you want to share them. But sometimes, especially in, say, I hate using these kind of like Fox News words, but like liberal bubble, like sometimes you may not fit in so to speak. Do you, do you ever run into that sometimes in terms of like people? Yeah, that's been a constant my whole career. Cause here's, here's like a dirty little secret about the post is that there's not a lot of people there are very liberal, you know, I mean, yeah. we, have, we have, you know, it is very ideologically diverse and probably more people tend towards the liberal side. Obviously we have our op-ed pages and, and our, you know, our coverage, uh, you know, tends to be more in that, in that vein. But um, and I always look at it as more common sense. You know, if I go to Georgia, I go anywhere outside of the tri-state area. It, you know, it feels like we're liberal compared to some of the conservatives. You know what I mean? Like it is right. sort right. of a spectrum, right? Um, but yeah, I've always come up against that. I've had like people say to me all the time, like, y you're you're a, like, well, we, you know, midway through drinks, they'll be like, you're, con you're a Republican or you're conservative. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, but you're so smart. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, or like, oh, you seem so cool. I'm telling you, Joe, like it, it goes on and on and on. Like I've had, I've had this happen on dates. I've had this happen. Like people are just stunned. Like they think, they think that you're on their team. And I'm like, I am on your team. I am on team. Like let's get shit done. But, um, but yeah, like just different approaches. And so I've had that. And I've also had, you know, people be downright rude. I've had a few people like cut off things and, you know, it, it, it is what it is. I, I always say like, I think P Donald Trump broke people's brains and, and I'm not even a Trump fan. And I, I just saw the way that the effect that his presidency had on people and, and how they conducted their personal business. And I, no, I never changed. I was just like, okay. Um, so yeah, but it's kind of fun sometimes. Yeah. No, it's, it's so fun. And I'm glad you brought up the point that the, the yeah. folks that work in the post, because I've, I've run into several that 
kind of lean more liberal at they work for a, for a conservative outlet. And, that, and I mean, you could probably stay the same down the street from you at Fox News. I, I, I've, oh, yeah. I've got a pretty good feeling a lot of those people in those back room are not, you know, NRA members or, or yeah, card carrying yeah. conservatives. It's like it's a job. It's it's a job. And that's important. And I know it, 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 when you get into your position, it's sort of like the lines are blurred. And yeah, and it does drive me crazy, like the ideology in newsrooms where now I almost feel like there has to be, like as I mentioned earlier, the group think like, if you work for yeah. a left leaning outlet, you have to be liberal. If you, so, if, and and vice versa for conservatives. But I'm I'm I've, I've always respected that about the New York Post that they're like, you know, hey, listen, here's what we're writing. You, we don't give a shit what you guys believe, but this is what we publish. So I think that's always been kind of admirable about the New York Post. Yeah, and and you know, it it really is so much more ideologically diverse. And and I think even you know when I say I'm conservative or Republican, you know, the best compliment I can get is. When Pete readers say like I don't even know how you vote, like I would I'd be confused on how you vote, and I think that's the biggest compliment ever because you know sometimes you call things out on both sides, and and it, and I think that's important. So because no you know no one's perfect. Yeah, yeah, it is funny. Uh, you know, thinking about like you know tribes and everyone sticking to tribes. I, I do I do find it funny that Republicans will only get pissed off fellow Republicans is once dogs get involved. Like the whole Christy Nome of it all right now. Like the fact that she yeah, yeah. she's. She said she said a lot of questionable things over the last few years. But, man, I, I kind of respect Republicans. And all of a sudden, like, all right, now when you're when you're shooting dogs, now we need to step in. So, I, so, so in a way, I'm kind of like, oh, good. At least at least even some of these these sort of like like so bold are Republicans are, are calling it out. So I, I do appreciate that. <laughs> your dog's behind you with a gun to your head, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, well, definitely. Yeah, Nathan is like, make sure you, you you speak about the dog thing. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know that that was like a real uniting moment I think, for everyone, Republicans, Democrats, and you know, there's a lot of problems with Noam and, and her book, and, and the dog obviously is the big alarm bell. But yeah, I I don't I don't know. I'm not I'm not really in a Republican bubble, so I don't really I don't have like tons. I guess you know what my friends from home that I grew up with generally conservative, not political at all. And I will say I have a lot of I spend most of my time with them and down in Jersey. And it's like a whole new world. There's no culture war stuff. They just want to raise good kids. They send their kids to the same Catholic school that we went to. And, you know, they tend to be more conservative, but they're not ideological and they don't talk about it. So I'm not surrounded by like a lot of Republican stuff. So it's kind of like, I don't know, like I, I'm not really knee deep in it. But uh, but yeah, no, there is a lot of like. There's a lot of idiocy on both sides. So, in in terms of New York now, the New York of it all, you know, I left New York four years ago, and I left yeah, for a job. So. I, I and I do miss New York. Going back to it, and I was I was someone someone was asking me the other day, like, what do you miss about New York? And since I kind of left New York in my forties, I, I I almost have like this, been there, done that. Like I don't have yeah. the FOMO. The only thing I miss, and I see this is if, from being in New York my entire life, and then being here is like the 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 just the vast amounts of culture choices like if you wanted to see jazz fusion on a tuesday night you mm -hmm. could probably find a jazz fusion night somewhere in new york city if you if a, if a comedian is going to play they're more than likely going to be in new york or if you yeah. want to see improv seven nights a week we have that so i do miss the culture uh, aspect of new york and i want to get into like the the shit of it all now uh kirsten i mean if if you do happen to turn on the news you're seeing that New York is having some issues with, you know, violence, uh, obviously the protests, but that's everywhere as a New Yorker there. Uh, and I always like to think that things aren't as bad as they seem. Like, you know, I visited Los Angeles uh, this past fall and you hear all the stories about Los Angeles burning. I'm like, no, it's 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 actually pretty nice. I mean, it's 85 mm -hmm. and sunny every day. Sure, there's home uh, people living on the street, but you could probably find homeless people living in Charleston on, living on the streets. So tell me about the current state of New York City, because I know you love the city. Uh, I, I can't imagine you ever leaving New York, maybe no. to go retire in Spain in like 25, 30 years. Uh, that's about the only thing I could see you doing, Kirsten Fleming. But what, what, yeah. what, what, what's New York like now? For and, and a real like New Yorker's point of view of what it's like living in the city. Yeah, I mean, I, I, people ask me this all the time. This is like the number one question. Like, don't go on the subway. Do you go on the subway? I ride the yeah. subway every single day, twice a day, sometimes three times a day, depending. Uh, yeah, no, I, I'm always on the subway. I head on a swivel I'm much more I'm much less carefree than I used to be for sure you know I I, I used to I, I take a lot of walks as well and I, I keep my volume down a little bit I'm always just uh, you know there there <laughs> definitely you know because there are 
my fear is someone's going to throw me on the tracks because that has happened a lot. And there's been a lot of random attacks in the subway. So that definitely is a thing, but I don't live in this heightened, you know, you, it's kind of like, you know, how New York is, right? If you see something and something doesn't feel right, you go wait up on the platform and you go, you go move out of the situation. Now, sometimes I, I do think that it's it, sort of the bad people are a little bit more emboldened because there hasn't been a lot of prosecutions. There hasn't been, uh, you know, it, the law, the enforcement of, of the, of crime has not been great. And, you know, when something happens where somebody's assaulted or thrown in front of a train or throw, you know, it's always the same story. The guy had like 40 arrests and he was, you know, never, you know, just was arrested two weeks ago for assaulting somebody. So I think it's a lot of the, 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 it's the same old story. And um, New York feels, other than like the doom and the gloom, it's it's a little bit dirtier than it used to be. Uh, definitely, I think there's standards have slid in terms of uh, where people are selling stuff all over the place. I did a I did a big column around Christmas time because I was shocked. Midtown, I mean, it, it was like a a quarter of like a medieval bazaar, and then they took all the and then it, the Brooklyn Bridge as well was just peddler after peddler, and it was really dirty, and disgusting, and I was. So it's a bit shocked, but they, they, I think they've started to clean a little bit of that up. The Brooklyn Bridge, they've gotten cleaned up. But overall, it feels, here's my thing. New York is way more expensive than it used to be. So it's everything, right? Charleston is probably not too far away, by the way, in terms right. of yeah. cost. Yeah, people see, it's, I'm glad you said that, Kirsten. People was like, oh, you must be able to have like a mansion for $500,000. I was like, no, you can't. <laughs> That's not a thing. But yeah, so yeah, the expensiveness is, is and it's funny you said that, Kirsten, because I remember, when there was that whole push of uh, corporations having their employees come back to work. I, I forgot what which banker it was, but he basically said, hey, we're paying you New York salaries so you can live in New York and come to our office. Uh, so the it, so it doesn't seem like if people are being swayed by the prices of New York. No, I mean, it, it, you know, now they're starting to, I think they're, they're starting to feel like, okay, we need to get people here 24-7 because, they're starting like my brother works for a bank and and so they're starting to say, okay, FINRA is making sure that we it will try that we need to be here five days a week, right? So I think they're missing money, obviously, on public transportation. The offices are not being filled. And then uh, you know, so yes, they are they are trying to get people back to work. I'm back in three or four, sometimes five days a week. And uh it feels it feels it feels crowded though. It does. It feels like doesn't feel packed like to the point where you feel uncomfortable but it feels like crowded again and and so here's the thing it's like every restaurant is full every like every bar is full like you can't just go sit in a neighborhood bar anymore like it's so confusing to me but it's so expensive and nobody has the money so i'm like where is it's a genuine question like we talk about this all the time yeah. like it is so packed yet it's so expensive you go out and it's like oh my gosh for a drink it's off the charts, how are these people paying this, this money? I have no idea. So it feels more packed than ever. It feels more Instagrammy than ever and TikToky than ever. Uh, it doesn't feel like, you know, you used to go to a neighborhood bar and you would have sort of a, a diversity of ages and, and uh, you know, people in their 70s and people in their 20s or whatever. And it was, you know, but that doesn't feel any, it feels much younger. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it's definitely, it's New York. I, I feel like it's always going to have a pulse. It's the pulse is a little different than than what I'm used to, but, but yeah, yeah. Kirsten, it speaks to what New York, like you just railed off like a lot of things that would drive people yeah. away. Yeah. You know, just, you know, just start with the expenses and then, you know, talk about the fact that you live on an, your head's on an eternal swivel yet yeah. people still want to live there. They, <laughs> they can't get this, enough of it. Was this not the tourist campaign that you, that they would want? Yeah. No, I mean, I, I don't think we're going to stick an I love New York sticker on this video, but but yeah, no, I, I think it's one of those things where to me, if I, when I speak to like kids in their, in their 20s, I'm like, you got to live in New York. Like yeah. if you are starting your life, you have to start there because you have to build it. You can find a network for anything in New York. And that's another thing I probably should say. Like literally, if you are into a particular thing, you will find your tribe there. You will find people like I always joke, you know, I took a screenwriting class in New York because it's you're legally obligated to do so if you live in, you know, it's like it's one of those things like. You can't get a screenwriting class in, I don't know, Boise. You can't get, you can't like every day. You can't, you know, like, in generally, you, you, you get day. that. Yeah. And generally, if you do get that in Boise, it's going to be some guy whose dream was always to write a screenplay and he's going to be teaching it. Whereas in New York, the guy who's teaching it has, 
you know, is like a, a robust resume under their belt. So yeah, yeah, it's yeah, a very- no, it's, it's one of the things where I think if if you're in, uh, something. If you're young and you have this opportunity like to afford living in New York and like living in a 500 square foot apartment, you have to do it. As much as we can talk about all the 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 flaws in in the system and and how, you know, how they're prosecuting crime, all, all that stuff. We could talk about that for days, but at the end of the day it's still the greatest city in the world. I I, I just to me, if you you if I if I wasn't at this point in my life where I was like comfortable and wanted to have like a backyard and all the stuff, yeah. I'd I'd still I'd still put up with New York, and I'm sure Kirsten, you will too. Until like I said, that time comes when you go to Spain and retire on some sort of beach villa somewhere. Yeah, no, I mean it's it's totally true. Like during COVID, we you know I was in Jersey a lot because we were working from home, and all my you know I have a massive group of friends that I grew up with, and my best friend who built built a room for me. Um, on the third floor of her house. She lives right by the water. And she's like, what are you doing? You're, you know, you're in the city. And my mom's here. My, my Tia Pili's here. My brother's here. You know, my, my cousins are all in Brooklyn. I have a lot of family here. Um, so, but I did, I spent a lot of time in Jersey and I spent one whole summer where I did not come back to the city for four months. And it was wonderful, but I was like, I couldn't do this. Like that way it was, it was only because it was COVID that made it really palatable because at the end of the day, I don't want to have a car. I don't want to be like living in a house siloed away from other people, you know, like it, it was great and it was fun for what it was. And then I just got to get back into this disgusting pile of whatever it is. I have no idea. It's just, I love mm-hmm. it. I love- All right. So I got to ask you this, uh, wrap up uh, by asking this question because you brought it up during uh, one of your answers is the fact that, that on a date, someone was shocked to find out that you were conservative. Would you mm-hmm. mind just for, for my enjoyment, could you play, could you, could you kind of role play how that went? So who is this person? Like w- at what point in the date did this come up? Because this, to me, this is fascinating to me that this comes up in the middle of the day and they're shocked by it. So can you, if you can remember this traumatic experience in your lives, uh, and I know you're not a snowflake, Kirsten, but t- tell me, take me back to that moment. Yeah, no, it was definitely not traumatic. Cause I was like, you're a boo. But anyway, uh, no, 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 he was, he was, he was a, uh, a guy I knew who I met. He had a shop on my block, really nice guy. And, uh, he, yeah, he asked me out. He just, I don't know, whatever we, we hit it off. We had a lot of, we had a lot of fun and we went out on the date and I can't remember how it came up. Oh, I think he said something about like, yeah, like Republicans are just the biggest idiots ever. They're all morons or something to that effect. And I said, well, Republican. And he was like, what? What? And then, you know, and we continue, you know, we still, we remained friends. We didn't have a connection. Um, we remained friends like for years. So it was never, but he would like to bring things up every now and again and be like, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I'm like, I, yeah, <laughs> like you're not, this is not really, you're not changing my mind. This is, but, but yeah, no, totally. Like I've had so many of these experiences. Like I said, like people dropping food, like out of their mouth, like what you're, you're, you're a conservative, you're a Republican. And, you know, but, uh, so it's like, you can see like the, the, the brain freezes and it does not compute the video game, like come over people's faces. So yeah, I mean, when it's, it's when people make assumptions like that all the time, you know, you're going to get that in so many different pockets of this country and pockets of, of groups, right? Like people think that you are like them or, you know, like they're, but I think it speaks to like how awesome having a, a diverse group of friends is too absolutely oh you you, you took the words right out of my mouth I, I i became dear friends with this redneck from virginia and he yeah. has like a full like assault team you know uh, in, in his closet like he has all sorts of guns and everything like that and he goes oh you, you he goes you want me to show you an ar-15 because i'd never seen an ar-15 i'm like yeah let's oh, see. No. he goes he goes and he shows it to me and he goes uh, oh, this is this is the gun that you Democrats want to get rid of, and so and then I re- re- retorted with, "Well, no, we only want to get rid of them because it's killing kids." And then we we kind of just had like this sort of like gallows humor about it, but like yeah. I think that's what's missing in in this world that, you, like you said, like mixing with uh, other ideologies, religions, who gives a shit? Like we're all people at the end of the day, and just if we give each other grace and find out why that person thinks, because you may. You 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 make curious. I know that guy, that guy's been trying to change your mind for a decade, but like you may have <laughs> an opinion on something, whether it's not, it may yeah. be not changing who you are, but like oh, that's an interesting point of view. Because it happens to me all the time. Because I am I'm dead set in my you know my my cliche right. New York liberal ways, but it's like if someone tells me something from from the other perspective, I'm like 
okay, I can see where you're coming from. And I think that is what's missing from this country because we're so polarized. We're so in our own tribes that we don't want to get out. And my wife hates when I do this. We're like, we'll be, we'll go to a party where it's going to be a lot of conservatives. She's like, please don't talk about politics. Please don't talk about it. I'm like, no, it's like, it's okay. Because I come in from humor. Like I like that. Yeah, well, that's I'm, a, that's I'm the first to make fun of Democrats and I'm the, and the first to make fun of Republicans. So what the hell, what, the, what, what, what are we arguing about? Let's have fun. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, it's like, okay, it's like the Jets, right? Are you going to sit here and, 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 you know, you're a big Jets fan, I'm a big Giants fan. They don't pay our, our mortgage, right? I know politics affects our mortgage a little bit more, but it, it is, it's foolish. Like, I hate, I, it's so strange to me that so many people are like, well, I, I just cut out my family because of the way they vote and I, I just couldn't take it anymore. And I think these things have ruined us. You know, I think we, uh, we've allowed, you know, this, this, this siloing, this tribalism to, to fester with our devices, which help us really just build our worlds to our specs and to our worldviews. And, you know, when, as I said, we, people don't read behind that beyond the headline. And I have a, I have some friends who are very liberal and they'll say to me, oh my gosh, like, uh, you know, something that is so incorrect, you know, like the, the Ron DeSantis, like, don't say gay thing. And I'm like, but it doesn't say there's, there's the word gay is not in it. Like, you know, but no, but yeah. that's what it says. I'm like, that's how it's been coined. So it's like, you know, you have these conversations with people and you realize, oh, I never read the actual article. I didn't read the tweet or that, that tweet that I read was totally incorrect. This was from a, a person who hasn't seen sunlight in 50 years and they don't know what they're talking about. So I think, you know, I think it's important to like every once in a while, I'll like step out of that. And, and also I think when you have an ideologically diverse group, I think like your life, your, your friendship isn't predicated on how you vote. Like how weird is that? Yeah. Like and that's, that's a new thing. For since, like we, we never remember what growing up, you never ask who you voted for or even knew who someone no. you had no idea no clue who, who you no. voted for no and, and, and i will say on the trump point of things i know you you and i are not the biggest trump fans um the one thing that drives me crazy about the trump of it all and it's not all the stupid things he does and says it's how everyone in the party is scared shitless of him like to me that seems so gross the other day tim scott was on the on the sunday morning talk shows and they asked him if he would accept the the results of the election and he wouldn't say, he wouldn't give an answer because he knows if he says I'll, I'm going to accept it, Trump's going to be mad at him and he's not going to be VP. Of all the Trump things, and I know this is kind of a weird thing to pick on with the Trump, like the fear. You know, we, we started this conversation talking about your fearlessness, but the fear in the party is the one thing that kind of like grosses me out. I'm like, do you not have a backbone that you can like, like I will say that about Democrats, man, we're not afraid to shit on each other, Kirsten, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Biden has, has got as many d Democratic d detractors as he does Republican detractors. But the whole the whole idea that everyone's afraid to speak out against Trump is really the one thing that concerns me about the direction of how we are as, as a country. It's a weird thing. He's like the elephant in the room, right? Like he sucks up so much oxygen. And and I think the you know, the worst thing that everybody did was start, <laughs> start throwing a billion political prosecutions on him because that made him the, the made him the candidate i mean i think he was yeah. sort of ready for the dustbin a little bit you know and he could have been a kingmaker and he's he doesn't want to be a kingmaker he wants to be the king he's, he's a and i say that not i don't think he legitimately wants to be king i think he's just he he just takes up so much oxygen and he's so funny like honestly i i want to watch him on stage just cracking jokes all day because he's 10 times funnier than most stand-ups out there but he's not my like love favorite choice um right for, for you know for president so um but we're you know he's the candidate and so so yeah. what do you do so yeah so he just i don't know he engenders this sort of strange loyalty which i don't really understand um he's a unique beast and i don't think we've ever seen anything like him i don't know he makes people act different i i, I don't know I, i've met him before he's very charming uh i i you know i have people who are friends with him i you know, they say he's he's like, again, I think he has something about him that's that's kind of special. So I don't know. I, but I agree with you. It's so weird. We're living some weird times, Kirsten. And, and thank you so much for sharing uh, some time with me. I know you're very busy. You're probably about to, maybe, I'm sure you're going to write a column about this idiot that talked you to you for 40 that. minutes. No, <laughs> this I, is your you next know, column. Joe, it's so you know, it's so nice to see you because uh, honestly, like so many people have left New York. And so much of, of the people who I really loved and, and you know, identified with and, and just, you know, I, I don't know, like kind of like my peer group, a lot of people have left. So like, it's nice, it's so nice to see your face and, and I wish that you were 
you know, down the block. I mean, you have coffee after this, but it'd be, it'd be nice. Well, well, Kirsten, uh, Charleston is welcoming. You are, you, uh, like I said, you're a conservative. You would fit right in here, Kirsten. So uh, if you ever want to come down, I got extra room. You could check it out. But thanks so much for the time today. I really appreciate it. Anytime, Joe. It's so good to see your face. And that's today's Good Listen. You can always connect with me on X, LinkedIn, or Instagram at Joe Partavilla or on TikTok at Jay Partavilla. If you want to shoot me a note, you can email me at JoePartavilla at ProtonMail.com. And if you're listening on Apple or Spotify, would you please leave a five-star review? And if you're watching on YouTube, give us a big old thumbs up. Thanks for spending some time with me today. Until next time, adios.